Thank you for coming to the Tivoli Room at the Throckmorton Theater. Please welcome Mr. Mort Saul. <laughs> A stage manager. <laughs> uh, this is all stage. Uh, as uh, Edwin uh, just brought me in, rolled me in, and uh, I had a big glaucoma procedure today. That's why I saw. And uh, <clears throat> otherwise, I have an even view of everything. And. Uh, uh, Our friend Kathleen Hahn producing this show, and those of you who've seen it before know that she's screaming on Periscope and uh, Facebook. So the question has come from all over the world, and, and you, of course, and I just sort of free associate with it all, and. Uh, <laughs> The great music is from Nathan Bickard, back here. My, who, uh, Nathan, you know, I got all, uh, all the Bill Evans on Alexa this week. And uh, I got it right on the floor under the couch. Do you know a song called But Beautiful? Oh, oh Mort, Nathan, Nathan uh, isn't in the room. Oh, you it uh, was written by Jimmy Van Heusen. And Sammy Cohn. And those guys used to work right in Sinatra in the living room. Uh, Jimmy Van Heusen uh, had a different name, but one day he was opening up a shirt and he saw Van Heusen on a rapper. So he changed his name <laughs> The Great Writer. And uh, uh, just associating freely here. Uh, very free. <laughs> and, uh, well, as you heard today, the president was declared innocent <laughs> <laughs> in a manner of speaking. Of course, you know, what do you think about living here? I mean, now it's warm, so don't let that mar your judgment in any respect. I was down at uh, Coyote Coffee, the Greg Bat one, and every time I sit down there, a guy says to me, well, another great day living in paradise. <laughs> and then I say, yeah, think what God could do if he had money. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it rolling, you know. But uh, this paradise is as defined. What else? I got a call from uh, Tony Lammy, who knew I worked as a presidential aide, you know, to Kennedy and to Jim McCarthy, who never made it, but stopped the war. And uh, Tony said to me, you should be happy that you're not working with those maniacs that are in there now. And I, I said to him, uh, we all can't be as lucky as you are. He's working with a great gang at Good Morning America. He's a motivational speaker. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so uh, was that Tony Robbins, the guy that encouraged you to walk up yeah. hot coals <laughs> so you won't take comfort for granted? And of course, people look like they're not crazy, but they are crazy. They look like they're not crazy because they legalize marijuana. So the people that are loaded look like they're not loaded. But it's something for you all to uh, think about. Uh, among other stories we're going to cover tonight. Uh, and. Uh, You notice that the English police grabbed Julian Assange after seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy in back of Harrods department store. I know it well. 
And of course, you know, Hillary impaneled a jury in Eastern Virginia against him when she was the Secretary of State because he dared to suggest that America wouldn't find weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq. And, uh, you notice we went over there and we never left. We went to Afghanistan and we never left. So, uh, it's fascinating stuff to think about. Uh, and, well, so, we, what were we talking about with Carl Kasten? Um, we were talking about your friend from Bethesda. Oh, yeah, Rick. Uh, I lived in a high rise there when I was on uh, the NBC affiliate when I was in Bethesda. And my wife was depressed because she's from a uh, hot country. And when it snowed and it got dark, uh, she got depressed. So this leads us to our quote for tonight. George Bernard Shaw once said, a woman will do anything for a man she once loved, except love him again. <laughs> Good writer. Maybe the best. Best one here, Thomas Wolfe. And uh, Thomas Wolfe said that greed is the enemy in America. He sits at the dinner table, and he masquerades a member of the family. But in the end, he'll change the family and eventually destroy it. And uh, Wolf, uh, there's a movie about Wolf, and they call Kidman a very bad movie. And, uh, but the writers try to tell you, they keep trying to tell you one thing or another. And you only have to go back to the writer. Uh, Shaw said, an actress is much more than a woman, but an actor is much less than a man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember everything I read. If you want to recommend books, uh, politically, the most important book you can read, Sam Lott, is The Secret Team by Colonel Fletcher Prouty, all about the CIA and how it appropriated the government. It's a master part of my education. They don't, during the, uh, uh, the uh, Democratic Convention, I was working at the Americana Hotel in Miami Beach. And in my audience was McGovern sitting with McCarthy and Humphrey. And McCarthy said, even if I don't become president, at least I was honest. I was an economics professor. And McGovern said, don't look at me. Uh, I was always an honest populist. And Humphrey said, I've got both you guys beat. I was a small town druggist. And McCarthy said, if you'd said that louder and earlier, every young person in America would have voted for you. <laughs> so sometimes you get lucky, you sit at a table and you hear stuff like that. Uh, I never understood the McGovern uh, thing. You remember all the liberals had him penciled in? Shirley MacLaine was arguing with him about legalizing abortion. And uh, that's an argument that goes on to Supreme Court and in fighting the right to life. How about the right to sanity? Isn't that time to exercise that? Isn't it? And at the same time, you know, I'm, uh, I'm in the audience like you most of the time. I'm not always up here. And I'm appalled at how bad the comedians are. That they're not concerned any, about anything but commercial success and are ill equipped to achieve it. Uh, 
what else? Oh, uh, my osteopath have a lot of specialized people putting me together every day. <laughs> my osteopath, Michelle, took me to a dietitian in Strawberry who mixed up everything and fed, fed me through an IV. As you know, this is a great move forward because our parents' generation were forced to eat the foods that contained these <laughs> nutrients. So, think about it. Do any of you remember radio? Uh, yeah. You remember Dr. IQ? Mm -hmm. Used to go into a theater and go and ask people questions, give them money, give guys a microphone. So, Henry Morgan, who was a comedian, inspired me. He said, uh, Where's my messenger with the money? And I said, I have a lady in the balcony, doctor. He said, in that case, I won't disturb you. <laughs> so, he was a protege of Fred Allen, of the late Fred Allen, who was supposed to be intellectual compared to Jack Benny. <laughs> and Jack Benny was, he was stingy. That was supposed to be funny. Yeah. Your money or your life? Wait a minute, I'm thinking of it. <laughs> One day I was walking through Central Park, Kathleen. Uh, a cop said to me, watch out, there's a guy on the loose with a gun. And I said, I don't have to worry, I don't have any money. So the writer, Herb Sargent, fantasized that the guy would come up to me and say, tell me everything you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I a lot of loose stuff along the way. Her work for Steve Allen, of course, which was never an employer. And uh, I must say, I really love that guy. And, you know, Steve wrote 8,000 songs and 54 books. He'd take any challenge, turn around, sit on the piano, don't look, just sit. Then he would transpose the first three notes she had into a song. And one of them became, this could be the start of something big. So, uh, a terrific guy. He was the only guy that would be Jim Garrison on the air in Granite County, assassination investigation. He was backstage, Steve, Steve was on the air. And I was on the air with Steve and Garrison. And Jane Meadows, Steve's wife, was back there with my wife, the time, Gina. And Garrison said, uh, Steve said, who killed the president? And Garrison said, the CIA. And Jane said, ha, 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 you must have so much fun being married to Morton. <laughs> she was drinking a coke and began to choke, which meant as an indication she didn't agree with that. <laughs> you gotta remember when they say they'll love you, they don't add forever very often. <laughs> it's not even a ceremony. From this day forward, isn't that it? Uh, <laughs> The guy that married Sheena and me was a, uh, a rabbi that got kicked out. I was going to say defrock. Did he defrock a rabbi? <laughs> <laughs> Pulling feathers out of a chicken. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, you see where free association can take you? It takes you back to the good times. Yeah. I did have a pretty good time in Berkeley. I told you when I came up here, you know, I wanted to get into show business. And my wife at the time was majoring in psychology in Berkeley. So I drove her and her two roommates back and forth to school. And I bought a 35 Ford three window for $35. And of course, it overheated when I went into Bakersfield. So the parents were waiting for them in Beverly Hills, and here I come with the car chugging and smoking. And they said, 
why are you so late? Parents really know how to get in the groove with people come home. And this girl who lives here, Ricky Pro, she said, we were late leaving Berkeley. And her father said, I don't ever want to hear the word Berkeley again. Get in the car. And he rolled up the windows and he sped off in his rage. And she was leaning out the window yelling, Berkeley, Berkeley. <laughs> so, you know, youth wants to be heard. I ran into her here. Yeah. Really sweet girl. Good person. Ran to a lot of people. I ran to a lot of people I don't know, too. Uh, the priority, uh, the uh, proprietor of, of uh, uh, Coyote Coffee, Greg Batman. I'm sure he's given me moral support, though. And uh, what's online, Kathleen? Anybody? Well, yes, Mort. We have a question about. Um a former U.S. senator that's running for uh, the presidency in 2020 by the name of Mike, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Gravel or Gravel, Do you, are you familiar with him? Is that the guy from the South Bend? I'm not sure. Oh, no, no, no. That is, that's, uh, that's, that's Pete, the Pete, Pete uh, Buttigieg. Buttigieg or Buttigieg. <laughs> You know what the LA police detectives would say when I was suggesting somebody wasn't sexually straight? They'd say, he was busted once for following too closely. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few times the LA police got right. Uh, anyway, what did you bring up? Mike Gravel. A former U.S. Senator, he's oh, running... Oh, yeah. He's a good guy. He was against Vietnam. He lived up here, didn't he? I don't know. He lived in the Bay Area for a while. No, Mike Ravel is a great guy. He worked with Gene McCarthy. He stood up for what was right. No double talk. Uh, and in those days... When I introduced the guys against the war to McCarthy, he'd say, welcome to the leper colony. <laughs> because Johnson, you know, was uh, going uh, all out. And I told you when I was at the Democratic Convention in Chicago, I said, Johnson's trying to get Humphrey the nomination. And his girl said to me, Humphrey will never be the president. He doesn't look like a president. So I reminded her, everybody can't be as handsome as William Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I remember that convention. The cops came out, they beat Hefner when he walked out of his house in the kidneys with clubs, the Chicago police. And one, two cops stopped McCarthy and asked him, to sign a loyalty oath for Mayor Daly. And uh, you'll love this too. If any of you get into Minneapolis, well, you know, here, you know the Target stores? They're owned by the Dayton family. And Mark Dayton ran for president. And he got up in his debate, which I was on, with McCarthy, and he said, My name is Mark Dayton. I don't have any political experience, but neither did Ronald Reagan. And then McCarthy said, my name is Gene McCarthy. I've been a senator for four terms and a congressman for six terms. And I was a professor of economics at the University of Minnesota. I'm on a first name basis with Stalin, Churchill, and De Gaulle. And he said, I hope you won't hold this against me. <laughs> Good guy. I've got a question. Somebody said, to him, why is Mort your friend? He said, we bring out the worst in each other. Hmm. A straight life guy. You don't see many people like that anymore. They 
tell you what they think. You know, when he was first elected, he represented a little town in Minnesota. And he got there and he only had two years before he had to run again. So he was on the floor all the time trying to get FaceTime and television. You know. Mrs. Beaker, Mrs. Beaker. Soon back there, a farmer stopped him. He said, you're never going to learn anything in there uh, because you're always talking. And he said to the farmer, you elected me to represent you. And the farmer said, we didn't elect you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Good American humor. Yeah. Which I don't think any comedians were right now. And, uh, More, we have a question in the room. Yeah, of course. I, so my question is, I've spent a lot of time in the past few years in Europe, and every single time I meet somebody, France, Germany, UK, they ask, how could this have happened, the Trump election? Well, my question is, how would you suggest it doesn't happen again? Uh, did you hear that, Mort? No, what was the first part? Um, she travels extensively through Europe, and she's always asked, how did this happen? How could we have let this Trump administration happen? Um, do you have any comments on how we can prevent it from happening again? Oh, well, you know, it goes back to what Rule Rogers said, don't vote for them, it only encourages them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, he is, the only good thing about a radio is it has an off button. <laughs> Roosevelt liked them. But this may not be the worst. God might be watching us and he's thinking if they're going to complain about this, I'll teach them a lesson. Get somebody else warming up. I mean, think of the madness of it all. I mean, any of you ever been to the Vatican? Mm -hmm. yes. That was built by Mussolini and donated to the Catholic Church. And you heard about the uh, the fire in France, didn't you? Yes. yes. What was that, Notre Dame? Yes. yes. They're making it into an Apple store. <laughs> 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 What's wrong with free enterprise? It isn't free. That's what's wrong with it. Uh, there it is. It turned out to be a weird country, but think what it was like during Vietnam. Remember people asking uh, Jane Fonda the political question? <laughs> she was writing that workout book. I know her very well. Those are intellectuals in America. Jane Fonda and Redford. Redford had a picture at the Sequoia last week. And the rumor is Lucy went. She said there was nobody else there. She called up the manager of the Sequoia and said, what time does the Redford picture go on? And he said, what time can you be here? <laughs> <laughs> and that's all turned into streaming now, I guess. <laughs> Kathleen, on the way over, you mentioned uh, uh, a picture of John Garfield. Yes. Uh, when I was hitchhiking, when I was in a service, John Garfield picked me up on Sunset Malore and he said, do you know what this war is about? I said, no, I just do what they tell me. He said, you're wasting your efforts. You have to know what, what you're putting yourself in danger for. And there's a wonderful line in a picture called the Blue Dahlia. Yeah. Yeah. Alan Ladd gets a ride on the Sunset Boulevard from Veronica Lake. Mm -hmm. And she lets him off. And she says, good, good night. And he said, no, it's not good night, it's goodbye. And it's hard saying goodbye. She says, why? Uh, you've never seen me before. He said, every guy's seen you before. The trick is to find you. Pretty good. Huh? The movies develop your capacity to dream. And uh, 
That's the reason I still remember all that dialogue. You know, in the picture, they were expendable, which is with John Wayne and Robert Montgomery as PT guys, PT boats, before they evacuate Corregidor. The officers decide to give a dinner as a nurse to Donna Reed, who's taking care of them after the ship was wrecked. And they get this little table together, and they all put on ties. And when she comes in, she's got coveralls on as a nurse. And they uh, Sandy and pull on a chair for her. She turns away and puts a locket on. Think what a, what a wonderful tribute that is to femininity. John Ford. You know, uh, you know, when the blacklist came to Hollywood, they started firing at it. They had a meeting of directors guild, and Cecil B. DeVille got up and he said, if people get rich in this country and don't love it, they should be blacklisted. And none of the Jewish writers there, the majority, said anything like that. And John Ford, a Roman Catholic, stood up and he said, my name is Ford, I make Westerns on the statement of the year. And he said, I've known you for 40 years, Cecil, but you're dead wrong in this one. He had the feeling of the people. You know, he could do it in a scene like the Irish rebellion against the English. And, and the English major said, we're doubling a reward for any Irishman. The IRA guys. Here, they show them the poster. Double a reward. And the guy looks in the mirror, the Irish cop, and he says, Well, do it. Now you'll know what you're made of. Boy, boy. The Irish people made a death a way of life. Remarkable. Very good movies. John Ford. The mill, of course, pretentious, yeah, Moses. Take two tablets and call me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I know Heston very well. Heston did the Steve Allen show with me. And he had the Oscar there from Ben Hur. And he said to Herb Sargent, there isn't much you can do after you got one of these. And Herb said, how about becoming an actor? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something else. I was in L.A. Uh, at the uh, Tiffany Theater for 17 weeks. But then I lost my son. And the real therapy was working. And I had guest stars on the show. Jonathan Winter, Heston came on one week. And he came out and he talked about how great Reagan was. He was a big Republican. And uh, at the intermission, he said to me, Mort, uh, you know, I wanted to do Moses' farewell to the Jews, but the middle of the picture was too long already. So I said, why don't you do it tonight? And I had one of the stagehands get a stick with a stab of wood. <laughs> and had still stood up in a blue suit. And he did it. And the audience got up on their feet and cheered. And he said, how do you explain that? I'm sure they're all liberals. I, mean, I said, because art can stop anybody in its tracks. It's not beating. And he believed me after that. Up in the room, we have our differences. Good guy, though. And uh, Jonathan Winters did that show, too. Kathleen reminded me last week was Winters' birthday. And uh, you know, he was the first guy to say, 
how do we know there are flying saucers? He's out in the field working for his father. And this saucer lands and the guy comes out with bells coming out of his head. And he says, take me to your leader. And Winter says, I can't because I don't know who my leader is. <laughs> he was right on the money. <laughs> Wicked. And, uh, and not, not stupid. That's the unfortunate part of the package. He ran out of Hungary Island one night, ran down to the harbor, and went up on the coast <coughs> of Malacuza, and Enrico talked him down. That was the San Francisco I prize. Really something. Yeah. Anything else, Kathleen? Yes, Mort. As you know, the redacted Mueller report came out today. Yes. So the question online is, was Darwin wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, how much did the Mueller investigation cost? Is cost? I mean, you have to live with the harvest. He's betting that most people are only looking for the bread. They're talking about the justification, but they want a job. Did you notice the Koreans have another bomb? And he got sanctions against them. He also is trying to sanction Cuba, which has a young president, guy, guy's like 38. You know, when uh, I was down there during the revolution, and Castro, had 60,000 people in the plaza. Viva la revolución. And out of that whole crowd, a dove flew in and landed on his shoulders. Quite remarkable. Although the Cuban Revolution was really, the imagination was uh, collected by Che Guevara. And you know, the guy that, uh, the guy that killed Che went up in the Bolivian hills and killed him. Worked at George Bush's office, senior. And you notice the guy Bolton who works for, for uh, Trump. Uh, Elliot Abrams uh, is a neocon who was pardoned by George Bush after being convicted in the Iran-Contra scandal in which the planes were run out of Mena, Arkansas. Guess who was governor? And then remember they shot down that one guy, Hassan Fus, and he sang. They skip all that, you know? And uh, they don't want to remind you of that. And uh, Colonel North, ran the dope down uh, and that game with the Iranians all over North. And he saw Fox News on staff. And uh, while I was in Virginia, North ran for governor. And the governor was a black guy named Doug Wilder. And I was in his bar. Doug Wilder said for North, you're not only convicted criminal, you're a liar. And North had an interesting defense. He said, that's right, I lied. And the people of Mars said, at last, a political figure who tells the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, Kenny, and he's still on Fox News, <laughs> along with Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram. Uh, <laughs> this country can you always ask, what is it going to take? This country takes a lot, you know, before it acknowledges the, the pain. Uh, there's a couple of good guys. Rand Paul is a good son. I don't know about Booker yet. I don't know. Schumer's the worst. 
at Fair Street. Why don't the Democrats want to know what that investigation cost? <laughs> and, uh, Mort, your friend from Bethesda suggested possibly 20 million. How much? 20 million. More. Easily. It was 25. Yeah, a lot of overtime and copies. And, you know, the rigor mortis says that. But they don't do anything. You know? And what they're trying to do, the FBI is trying to get its reputation back because it was appropriated by the CIA. Do you remember that guy, uh, Mandy Patinkin? Remember that guy? Yes. He played Brennan, the head of the CIA, a person of interest. And he said when his agent offered him a part, he flew to Washington and met Brennan at the CIA. He wanted to make sure he approved of him, you know, before he prostituted himself and made the head of the CIA. For, former Ford graduate into a heroic figure. Otherwise, he wouldn't have taken that role. Don't you love when actors show this sudden attack of principle? <laughs> I mean, you gotta wonder. Uh, but there, there are some guys you remember. You remember when Garfield worked with Lance Her? The postman was wearing his watch. They kill her husband. And then the police have to break them down to question. Pretty good. And uh, he's a big star. And they destroyed him with the blacklist. Uh, you know Alan Betsy? And he died while making a well, So did Nelson Rockefeller. He did a lot of stuff at this show. <laughs> Want to suppress material? We have another question in the room, Mort. Yeah, please. The, the Hollywood Thirteen. Alma Bessie lived here. He had Alma Bessie. Yes, he worked at the Hungry Eye. Yeah. He ran. Uh, he ran the sound. Enrico gave him a job on principle. And uh, after listening to me for three years there, he said. This guy had nothing but Bob Hope with political references. <laughs> I was hoping for more approval than that, being a fighting crusader. Alma Bessie, yeah. The Hollywood Ten. And, uh, but the pictures have character in them. You really do care about Jimmy Stewart. And, there's a couple, you know, you all know Mr. Smith goes to Washington, and it's a wonderful fight. There's one with uh, Stewart in which uh, the Civil War comes along, and his parents find they can give a commission if they give $400 to the Union, get him to be an officer, and he does. They sell their horse to do it. Family owns a horse. And he, he reluctantly says goodbye to the horse. So while he's serving, he has to take a message to Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln says, Do you write to your mother's son? He said, Yes, sir, I do. He said, Well, sit down at that desk and write this little mother letter, tell her you're safe. They humanize the president, the writers. And Stuart does, then finally they overcome uh, the rebels. And the rebels have got all the horses they stole from the Southern troops. And guess who was independent? His old horse. And he embraces them and the horses. Everything but embrace him. <laughs> they did something in the movie that they don't do anywhere in a picture called One Foot in Heaven, uh, Frederick March is a preacher and he has old clothes the congregation gives him, carrots and food, you know, 
and his parents are terribly ashamed. I mean, his children. And uh, then the clan comes down here and tells him they're going to burn out his house. And he says, I stand with God, I'm not moving. So the clan guys back up, and after they leave, the people next door come up with four shotguns, and they said, that's in case God wasn't in when you called him. <laughs> I tell you, the movies really have some spirit, if I can remember back to all that. And in the picture of uh, Dodsworth, Uh, Walter Houston is a rich guy like Ford, and he goes to Europe and his wife goes for every fraud she can find with medals and everything. And he said, I'm going home to America, Mary. She said, you can go where you want to. You'll never get me out of your blood. And he said, maybe not, but love has to stop somewhere short of suicide. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, Gregory Peck tried to remake that with William Wyler directing, and Grace Kelly is a good girl, Mary Astor, and Elizabeth Taylor is a bad girl, and he couldn't get the financing, oddly enough. But that's not the first mistake. They bet on the nature of the American people. Uh, who know collectively when something is wrong. They don't always know individual. That's why they vote for the wrong people. You know this jury against Assange? It was impaneled by Hillary Clinton five years ago in Eastern Virginia to encourage him not to pass along what he knows he got a great mother. The moral fiber is evident when you see his mother. See, there are parts of you that can be accumulated and inherited. When I went to New York the first time to be a comedian, you know, my father gave me $40. And I made the trip by driving two ladies who didn't drive. And I had my mother's manners, they used to stop to get something to eat on the road, and I'd say, I'm not hungry. If I went in, I'd have coffee. And I went to New York, and I didn't succeed. And along with me was a young comedian named Jonathan Winters, and neither one of us succeed. And the second time, we finally got to work at the Blue Angel, and it was a East Side Club in a tuxedo, and gay piano players. And uh, the owner wouldn't talk to us. He'd just make his comments referentially. Like he'd go out into the club and say, I can't hear you louder. So I said to Jonathan, I can't hear him. What did he say? <laughs> Jonathan said, he said he can't pay us. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and Jonathan was back there with his, his wife. And I was back there with Susan, who's in Berkeley. And now I've met somebody else in Berkeley. So Berkeley never goes away. Uh, in a way. I don't know about schools, I didn't get well, I went to SC. I had the GI Bill, thanks to Roosevelt. And uh, I was taking a class called Organization, Administration, and Management. Catchy, huh? <laughs> and the teacher in it said to me, if all you can do is criticize the way our leaders are doing their job, I suggest you become a comedian. <laughs> I'm still trying. <laughs> yeah, let's see, I'm going to move my seat. You know how far they went down there? You remember Helen Gagg and Douglas? Married to Melvin Douglas? 
was a senator. They incorporated 36th Street, which bisects the campus, to make it a public street to it. And then finally University Street, so she couldn't campaign there. The pink lady, Nixon called, and he got elected. A very good senator, and he was a very good actor, Douglas. And he's in a wonderful picture called uh, Mr. Blanding that builds his dream house with uh, uh, Myrtle Roy and, and uh, Cary Grant, whom I know very well. No ego, busy doing the job. I knew his wife, too, Diane Cameron, who wrote a book, you know, Damning Him. Good luck with that. <laughs> Telling American people they don't like them when they love them. It's nuts, isn't it? And I want to die in your restaurant. That's what I'm better. You know anything about acting in your restaurant? Let me tell you what. The biggest uh, known graduate of an acting class is Marlon Brando, of course, for the method that he learned from Strasbourg, a streetcar named Desire. So, when Strasbourg died, they had a private viewing of the body, and Al Pacino came up and looked at Strasbourg there, and he said, somehow, Lee, I don't believe you. And they all swear by that. One day I was in class with Sanford Meisner. And uh, the guy got up and he said, I'm going to show somebody eating a banana. So he peeled this imaginary banana. He started to eat it. And sitting next to him, there was Cloris Leach from the actors. And she said, this guy's concentration is incredible. I can smell the banana. <laughs> and there's a guy behind her eating a banana. <laughs> you know, after, uh, one time I was in Tiffany's in New York, and uh, who was it? The Dame of Todd Baby and Robert Blake. Uh, anyway, she went in there and she, she said, Mail this to this address, and the, the, uh, the uh, sales lady said, What part of London do you live in? She said, I'm not English, just affected. <laughs> <laughs> so, acting, acting classes are a big thing. Joanne Lord, the three faces of Eve, came out of acting class. And some guys created them himself. Yul Brenner created himself. And a good guy, great guy. And if you ever get the chance, look in a video store for a movie called Burn with Marlon Brando. Pretty wonderful. I showed it to Robin up here, and he was hypnotized. Uh, it's about the way in which the CIA grabs a country. And it starts with it. an Englishman getting off a boat, carrier bag, senor, and he takes a guy and makes him into Castro to get the Portuguese out of the country. And they betrays the guy and they hang the guy. And in the end, Brando comes to another country for the English CIA and he gets off a boat and he smiles to himself. The little black guy saying, carry your bag, senor. He said, yes. And the guy takes the bag and puts a knife between his fifth and sixth rib. It was made by Gino Pontecorvo, who also made the Battle of Algiers. There's a lot of, you know, gold in those video stores. And I tried with Lucy to run a movie series here. And 
we had luck with more luck with some than others. We showed a movie called Junior Bonner with Steve McQueen and very few people have seen. And he's sitting in a bar drinking bourbon. And his brother comes up, who's the materialist in the family. He says, Junior, I'm going to whip your ass. And Steve says, Well, somebody's coming. <laughs> His father is Robert Preston in the movie, who said, You know, Junior, I'm a prom writer after all these years. I kind of expected more from you. And Steve said, Well, somebody's got a whole horse. And that humility instantly communicable. There's some great stuff out there. People aren't as good as what they try to do in a movie. Mort, yeah. you mentioned Robert Blake. There's a question asking if you were very uh, friendly with him. Yes, at one time. Uh, I used to go to jail and see him every day when I had him locked up down there before he got bailed. But he's always suspicious of everybody. Yeah. What's in it for you? He's married again. And he's uh, 85 now. A pretty good actor, but pretty nuts. That seems to be part of the package. <laughs> uh, yeah, I knew him very well. I used to go down there, you know, I had talked to him on the telephone, you couldn't get in there, but I kept him in the same room where I kept OJ during, remember that interminable trial, in which we lost a lot of our freedom. People would ask him, say that he's guilty, and if you said he didn't know, they resented it. The whole idea of the way people pick something one incident up rather than the destruction of a society, and more logically, the destruction of love. You're suspicious of you even espouse that. But the American movies were our statement to the world. That's why I think they're so important. That's uh, this thing you can't explain about movies. You can't explain why Kennedy wanted Cliff Robertson to play him in PT-19, not Warren Beatty. He knew that you believe Cliff Robertson. I know him very well, and I can tell you you believe him. Uh, very winning style. In fact, he was married to Dina Merrill, and Merrill Lago, where Trump is now, was their house. Her father was E.F. Hutton, and her mother was post great nuts. I worked in I worked in Palm Beach many times. At uh, very pleasant place. Rush Limbaugh lives there, and the Kennedys lived there when I worked for the Kennedys. And uh, the old man, Bobby, was more like the old man than Jack was. Getting even, uh, the Jews were out for money, all oh, that standard hoker. There, there are margins, you know, why people are different. Henry Wallace, William O. Douglas, were different, but the reason I could speak for also. And old man Kennedy just thought the money could do it all. It, uh, the nicest guy that married any of the Kennedys was Sergeant Shriver. Yeah. And, uh, 
and gas is most expensive in California. Gavin Newsom. <laughs> Tesla people might be here now. That's funny. Eh? I didn't know I felt that philosophical tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any questions in the room? Any other questions? Um, yes, Joe. The Warren report came to some conclusions. Why do you think the Mueller report hasn't come to conclusions? The Warren report came to conclusions. Why do you think the Mueller report has not? Well, uh, the Warren report, of course, was was rigged by the people that wrote it. I'm very familiar with that. I read every inch of it. But nobody gave a country more than that. It's really awful, laden with lies, and Warren's name was to clean it up, you know, but Johnson put him on because everybody thought the liberal governor and chief justice, <coughs> and uh, you know when he gives it to Johnson, Johnson said, at this relentless investigation, we've identified the killer and everything. And Warren says to him, here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the few living Americans who read that thing. And boy, it's, just, it's really tough going. And you know, you, you have to appeal to people's hearts. For instance, one of the reasons you have desegregation is that Justice Douglas went for lunch with Warren at the Supreme Court, and he said, Earl, do you realize there's still parts of America where a black kid can't go to school with a white kid? You're kidding. <laughs> so it's that. And it worked on him personally. Douglas Carr, Mark O'Gah. You know, in front of the Supreme Court, the big sign that says, the past is prologue. I said, what does that mean? Douglas said to me, it means you ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> Great man, Oregon, 40 years old in the Supreme Court over all the objections to Roosevelt putting him there. Uh, how do you suppose he kept going with 30 pounds of iron around his legs and dealt with Stalin? Elliot Roosevelt, you know, the oldest son of the president, he told me that when Roosevelt sat down at the Temple Church once, said, uh, Oppenheimer and Einstein have a bomb that can stop all war. And uh, Stalin didn't even blink. Right? What? Nothing. Those are people of iron reserve, you know. If you get a chance, read a book about the Battle of Stalingrad. The Germans surround the city, and the city fights on for two years. Then it begins to snow. And in the morning, 93,000 Germans surrender, covered with snow, including seven field marshals. Russia, Russia can't easily be dismissed. And if you're Jewish, you really know that. If you're Russian Jewish, or... That's pretty heavy stuff for counting. But... <laughs> Mark, we have one last question online. Oh, yeah? Did Justice O. Douglas pitch you in a direction that changed your life? What event? Justice O. Douglas. Oh, Douglas. Yes. Well, uh, that, this, thing, by the way, is, is written in the uh, new version of Heartland on Amazon. Douglas said to me, Kennedy is the best thing since Roosevelt, and he can't hold his father against him, and it's the only 
chance we have against fascism. I, I never told that before. And he told me that by identifying the CIA as a killer, I could reclaim the country. Hell of a guy, I am married five times. <laughs> I mean, never lost his interest in life. That's the reason I'm so persistent. Even though I fail, I keep taking a course. Because you know? uh, I think women know some things we don't know. And if we're lucky, they'll tell us. Uh, well, how you process love? I don't know how you encounter it to begin with. But how you process it is really a mystery. If it scares you, the opportunity, you're not in the human race anyway. Uh, you know, I was just mentioning to Nathan when I got that, that song by uh, Jimmy Van Houston. Love's a good thing, or it's bad, but beautiful. Overall, the coloration is always to her whole. That's what you have to master as a writer. And I don't know how many people in this generation are going to write. I think a lot of them are just going to get loaded. Now that that's legal. <laughs> you notice the government only forbids you trying to reclaim your soul. You know, uh, the death tax, Gene McCarthy called it the last toll booth on the way out. <laughs> 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 so, I hope this wasn't too academic, you know, but I tried to treat you like you're in my living room. <laughs> this was when you want to be in my living room, but still, <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, I think about this stuff all day. The art of the possum. The art of a possum. You know, and, and then, you know, moments come up. I was on the Tonight Show with Carson once, and a famous Italian actress came out, and she had this band aid. And Connery said, what's it for? She said, I just did this picture in Spain and a snake bit me. And Connery said, I'd be happy to help you get the poison out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what television was really good. <laughs> you know. But uh, thank you for your patience, everybody. I hope we covered everybody down. We did, more. Thank you. Thank you.